Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Moi Fung, and I have the awesome opportunity of hosting today's session at the BBPA Ask a Professional. Now, before we get started, I want to say hello to our audience members. I want to know where you're joining from. And please, if we can just share the links with our brothers, our husbands, our friends, our cousins. Listen, today's discussion is going to be one that you don't want to miss. And sharing is caring, right? So please, please, please share the link. So if you haven't joined us before, we're an Ask a Professional. It's a series that offers ongoing discussions with industry experts in various fields. We talk about business, professional development, personal development, health and wellness. And uh, we do have an amazing giveaway that's going on right now. It's for the Zuka earbuds. You are required to fill out a survey at the very end of our discussion here. So please, please stick with us. And like I said, do uh, invite your friends. Now, I'll just share a little bit more about uh, the uh, survey. So at the end of today's program, you'll have the opportunity to fill out the survey and the Zuka Soul uh, new wireless Bluetooth in-ear uh, stereo is meant to deliver superior sounds anytime, anywhere. The lightweight in-ear stereo is designed in a way that comfortably sits in your ears and won't even feel like it. At the end of the programming, as I said, um, in the month of December, uh, one winner will be drawn uh, from the survey participants. So please, please, please participate. So as you're aware, November, our focus was men's health and wellness. We had discussions covering navigating the healthcare system with Hassani Brissett from Medex Health Services and cultivating mental health and wellness in Black men with Chief Warrant Officer Anthony Jones from the Canadian Armed Forces. And to wrap up November, I am so excited. <laughs> <laughs> to discuss men's health and the role of support fist, uh, sorry, the role of support systems featuring Danny Stone, aka Coach Stone, Sam Tita Jr., and Dr. Andrew Blackwood. Wow. So I'm going to <laughs> introduce Danny Stone first. He is a media guest expert, an international speaker, he's an author and a community servant. He is the founder of Champion U Academy, an online platform that helps entrepreneurs make impact, income, and influence. His podcast, Grind and Gratitude Show, has reached listeners in more than 60 countries. He holds certifications in coaching and business advising and is a certified learning and development professional who provides deep insights that helps individuals tap into their greatness and achieve goals they never thought possible. Danny has led learning and development for major organizations in the financial, nonprofit, and education sectors, and has helped countless people achieve their life and business goals. Danny believes that everyone has an inner champion, and he teaches people how to break through challenges and live in their potential. Danny, can you join me on the virtual stage, please? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, can you tell I'm excited? How are you doing, Danny? <laughs> I'm good. You know, Coach Stone is in the building. <laughs> I was Stone. thinking, who are you talking about? I was like, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that is you. That is you. And I'm glad you're able, able to join us live and direct. Now, our next guest is Samuel Tita Jr. Samuel Tita Jr. was born in Toronto, Ontario. He's Cameroonian and Guyanese descent. He is an entrepreneur and social activist with Want for Change. Samuel is the founder of Black Men Style, an organization that was designed to help change the dominant narrative and perception of how Black men are viewed. He brings awareness to issues surrounding distorted representations of Black men from media of all forms while uniting the Afro diaspora. Samuel is the founder of a custom suit company called Malcolm Exclusive Menswear. Samuel's hope is to inspire the next generation by positively impacting the community of today. Sam Tita Jr., I met your father as we discussed this morning and he's absolutely amazing. Now, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Andrew Blackwood. He's a husband, father, and mental health professional. Dr. Andrew Blackwood, affectionately known as Coach Drew, we have two coaches in the house, <laughs> has been using healing communication to address the spiritual, emotional, and mental health needs of individuals, couples, families, and organizations for more than 18 years. Andrew's healing journey through anxiety and childhood divorce helps him appreciate the painful challenges of those he works with, as well as God's grace 
and power to overcome. As you will see and hear, his approach to addressing anxiety, esteem, and emotional injury is simply to understand yet deeply effective and promoting healing in relationships. Listen, without further ado, I'd love for each of you to join me on the virtual stage. Am I seeing, are we all highlighted on the stage here? I don't know if we are, because I think I have a different uh, perfect. Uh, we're coming in perfect. now. Perfect. We're I do see now. you all see coming you. in. Oh, okay, we we're all there here now. Bam Tita, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. How's everything with you? Everything is great, and I'm so glad to have you, Coach Stone and Andrew Blackwood, of course. So glad to have each of you. Now, once again, for our audience members who's just joined us, we're here speaking about health, men's Black men's health specifically, and the role of support systems. Please, if you can, share the link with your family, your friends, your brothers, your sisters even, because we as females need to be, support. we're support systems, right? We're supposed to be anyway. So I thank you once again for joining. Now, we're going to get started without further ado. Now, gentlemen, and I'll start with Samuel Tita. <laughs> when it comes to support systems, and you know, you can all answer this, of course. When it comes to support systems, what comes to mind and what supports do you you personally rely on? Um, when it comes to support systems, um, now initially, um, you know, I would say family, friends, you know, um, which are you know pretty standard for for some people, but not for everybody. Um, but sometimes it's you know just the the community at hand. So um, be it you know other like minded individuals. Um, it, you know, be it whatever space that you are in. So, I mean, for me, um, you know, recently, at least within the past, you know, within the past year or so, um, I had um, joined up with um, a brother um, by the name of Troy Crossfield, who actually runs a men's group. And um, in that men's group, you know, is a whole different community of men that I had never met before. And, you know, amongst those men are men who have, you know, been through, you know, several different things. And with that alone, um, the the type of support um, that has come from that group alone has been, you know, more more than, you know, I think most men have ever received. So um, I would say that would be a, um, a, a great focal point for um, for support would be, you know, something as a men's group. Perfect. Thank you so much. How about you, Coach Stone? Who do you rely on in terms of support system? Well, I agree with Sam, Samuel. Um, you know, your family and your friends. And, you know, for me, I have a small group of really solid friends that we can share anything. We can hold each other accountable. We can have really open and honest conversations. And um, I started this sort of champion you group um over the last couple of years, and it was an opportunity for people to kind of get together to talk about how they were really feeling over the last few years. And from that, we've kind of formed subgroups for men. And so we do, I do have these groups that we kind of, we talk to about different things, finances, emotionally, how we're feeling. And so that's, that's uh, one of my support systems. And then I have mentors and elders that I can go to as well in the community that, you know, I trust and and that I feel comfortable sharing with. And so I, I have that support system as well. That's beautiful, beautiful. Andrew, Dr. Andrew Blackwood. Yeah, I, I agree. I do have friends as well, family, um, very close family. I, I'm very blessed that way. And my my faith is a big support system for me, not mm -hmm. just the community of the church, but um, the thing that I probably rely on the most heavily is my journal. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's prayer every morning every night unless I've had one of those you know really exhausting days um, I am processing my thoughts and reflecting and if I don't do that I don't function well uh, and, and that's just me so you know having a system uh, internally spiritually you know and it, and it bleeds into all these other relationships too so that's that's what works really well for me I love that. And I love that. So men, journaling is a thing for other men. Yeah, <laughs> right. I do too. Thank Me you. too, Andrew. Absolutely. Well, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Now I'm going to go back to Samuel Tita because you spoke a lot about the community support systems and so forth. Now, what roles do you 
um, as it pertains to community support, what roles does the community play in promoting preventative health care for Black men? What roles does the community? Yeah. So, in what way? Let's mm -hmm. let me rephrase that. I do apologize. So, in what no. ways? In what ways can community support systems play a role in promoting preventative health care for Black men? Um, I would say um, educational events for sure um, would be one of them. Um, you know, offering accessible health resources. Um, that's another one. And um, that's one thing, especially with um, with my organization, Black Men Style, that's one of the things we've tried to offer um, for our brothers because there really isn't anything when it comes to, um, I guess, support for Black men. There isn't much, right? And even if there is, um, a lot of men are very unaware of it. Mm. So, um, you know, one event that we just did, you know, just last week was... Um, it was mental and physical health, right? So that was the focus. Um, it was for brothers who, you know, either are new to the gym or are experienced in the gym, but just, I know, kind of want to be around that community of men. And that's one thing that's very, um, that's very much so the norm for women um, when it comes to um, to things like exercise is, is, is group dynamics. And it's not as much of a common thing for men unless they're, you know, in a sport, if anything. Um, so that was one. Um, another one we did um year um was just have more of a of a conversation. Um it was uh it was completely focused on mental health. We had um we had uh uh, uh what did we have? We had um a brothers from um, maneuver men grooming. Um they spoke on you know on men's grooming as a whole. Um, because we know that um, that definitely does play a part in our mental health. Um, we had, you know, my father speak. He spoke more so on, um, I guess, you know, the 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 Afrocentric styles of um, of uh, of how we, you know, kind of go about things as as black men. And then we had David Grant, who also is a uh, he is a um, he is a therapist. Right. So he spoke from an Afrocentric lens as a black male therapist. And we had another brother who spoke more so from the uh, I guess you would say the the standard, the standard side of how, you know, it's broken down for most men um, to kind of go about things. So <clears throat> I would say having more events tailored for black men would definitely make a difference. Um, there are events for men, but I think a lot of brothers have, um, it's either, you know, the conditioning, you know, growing up and stuff like that, um, where they might not feel as comfortable, but when you know that there's a space, you know, made for you, then you're, you're more, you're more likely to show up and not just show up, but even ask questions, um, and listen in and, you know, brothers are in there taking notes and everything like that. So, um, I think things like that will, will definitely, definitely play a big part. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for the incredible work that you're doing to be the change that you want to see. So thank you. And I'll, I'll go to Andrew Blackwood to answer that question as um, as well. Did you want yeah, to piggyback? Yeah. Did, go ahead. Yeah. So when I, when I think about community and I think about some of the things that are different about our community and that might be missing that could be helpful is to appreciate the idea of continuity. and to plan to commit for the long haul, mm -hmm. right? It, it's one thing to have a conversation, which is important, which is good, but to be prepared to journey with one man as he goes from be boyhood to, to be a teenager, to being a young adult, to being a, a, a full grown man, with maybe a father, business owner, being committed for the long haul, I think is really, really important because sometimes there's this absence of continuity. Who is going to be there? All these changing channels, different groups. And so I think uh, keeping that in mind, thinking about quality, not so much quantity, but really investing so that you are building this person, building this relationship, because that's what's going to continue to the next generation, then the next generation and the next generation. I love that perspective, uh, Coach, uh, Coach Drew, because 
I work with a lot of individuals with um, men, women, youth with mental health challenges. And we find because of the lack of continu continuity, continuity uh, the commitment for the long haul is what you said, because a lack thereof, many of them fall through the cracks, mm -hmm. right? So I certainly do love, uh, love that point. Now, we talk about mental health concerns faced by Black men. Uh, Coach Stone, I'm going to project this question to you. How can support systems address these challenges? I mean, it's like anything else. First, ask people, like ask Black men, what is it that you're facing? What are some of the challenges that you're having in your career, in your business, financially, in your family? Like the first thing to do is to ask. Like a lot of organizations go out there and they have a mandate um, and it's the mandate is usually around whatever the government is giving out money for. And Black men kind of get lost throughout the cracks, right? And so asking Black men specifically, what do you need? Instead of going out here, creating programs and services to meet your agenda, as opposed to the needs of the Black man. Mm -hmm. That's the very first thing you should do when you're doing anything. Mm -hmm. Ask. Mm -hmm. And then once you ask, create the spaces. It's it's like everyone else is saying, create those spaces and those opportunities for Black men to come together to feel heard that are safe spaces, that are non-judgmental. And I think sometimes we think that it always has to be a formal situation. It always has to be a forum, or it always has to be a talk, or it always has to be an event, when sometimes it's just about getting men together in a space with some refreshments where they can just talk, where they can just talk. It doesn't always have to be a mega event. It can be just a safe space where men can get together, feel like they're heard, non-judgmental, and we we have this conversation. And, but then it goes back to what Coach Drew said. You can't do that one time. It has to be continuous. What is the commitment over time? A lot of us have traumas from our childhood, from you know, our grandparents and beyond. And so we're carrying this big burden with us and no one's ever stopped to kind of think that we have this heavy load. Now it's time for us to unpack this load. So we need safe spaces where we can just share and organizations can commit to that. Ask us what we want. We'll tell you and provide it. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but people have to trust you as an individual or an organization. And I think that's sometimes where we have a challenge because people have reached out for help and that individual or those organizations didn't provide the service that we mm. expected. And so people get discouraged and they actually fall deeper into this, you know, these limiting beliefs that anything can change. Absolutely. No, I, I do that. Thank you, Cordelia. That was, uh, I was going to address the question in the chat, but you've just answered it as what is what she's saying, or he's saying, uh, Cordelia Gibson. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to go on to the other, the, the, the uh, Sam Tita, I'd like you to answer this one if possible. What initiatives um, or programs, you know, we, we've heard about the stuff that you're doing in the community, which is excellent. We've, we've heard about the work that, you, and we've, we've seen and witnessed the work that your father is also doing, but what other initiatives and programs have been successful in engaging black men? Um, in proactive health management and how can we replicate or expand upon them? Um, I think just, um, you know, like uh, Coach Stone said is, well, one asking, right? So asking what 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 is it that brothers want? What is it that brothers need? And um, I think one thing that a lot of people forget is not every Black man wants the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and one thing that you know, I've one thing that I've noticed over the years is that as I've gone along and we've kind of created these different programs, it's really it comes down to just opening new doors. So we did um, a Black men's yoga event, right? A lot of brothers don't do yoga. Even if you Google Black men yoga, you're not going to find anything. If you'll find maybe one or two things, and those things aren't over here. The majority of those things are in America. So. Um, you know, we did the event and the brothers that came out. Now, these are brothers that I've never met before, never seen before. We've never, you know, had conversation, but they were black men. So that was a space that was comfortable for them. There's conversation that came about there. 
um, just like we did the the um, the the one the the gym one, right? It was a completely different group of brothers, you know, different interests, but it was a safe space for them. Um, we've also, you know, done um, there's the black men there. So we also did an art exhibit, and we also did a poetry event, right? And those were both titled um, our perspective as black people, our perspective of black men through art and through poetry. And there was a different group of black men that come into those spaces. So it's just about asking and then, you know, we can go about creating these programs. And then if we see what works, then we just replicate it. Or we just tweak it here, we tweak it there. And, you know, now there's spaces for other black men. Not And, and just, just like you had said, you know, not every event has to be a, a mega event, right? We also do the Black Men Style Unity Shoots, which is more of a mega event, event which we have like 100 Black men outside. It's a great networking event. Um, and brothers do tend to section off, right? Um, amongst who they feel more comfortable with and everything like that. So it's um, it all comes down to just asking. Just asking and then tailoring it, you know, to make sure it fits, you know, whichever group of brothers fit in whichever space. I love that. Thank you. And I love the diversity of programming that you that you offer, right, to suit the needs of the different, the diverse men. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that. Now, we we always what I've found in my journey is that oftentimes we want to put the responsibility on um, on someone else, you know, mm -hmm. to create these programs. We want to put it on the organizations, the employers, the, you know, the government, right? Mm -hmm. But I think within our own right, we have that responsibility as family and friends to contribute to the supportive and uh, to be supportive to um, to black men, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask this questions uh, this question to Danny. How can families and friends contribute to creating a supportive environment that encourages black men to prioritize their health? Yeah, I think that's a tough one. I mean, a lot of us, um, we don't feel we feel we don't feel comfortable talking to certain family members and our families. You know, a lot of our families, we're good with the cookouts and you know having the the social events, but a lot of us avoid difficult conversations, right? And it's mm -hmm. because of those years of trauma and really nobody really wants to unpack that. But it has to start with someone, mm -hmm. right? And so you know, I know me personally, I've. I've gotten my family together and said, okay, what do you need help with? Who's struggling with what? We're a family. We need to be open and honest with each other. And I think um, it's difficult and it's challenging, but we have to have difficult conversations with each other. It can't always just be laughing and smiling and, and partying. Like you have to actually have difficult conversations. And maybe you start with one person. Maybe you start with a sibling. Maybe you start with an aunt or a cousin or your mother or father, whoever you feel comfortable with having these open conversations and saying, look, I'm struggling right now. And just the fact that you open up allows other people to open up as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there've been times over the last two or three years where I said I was struggling in some area of my life. And, you know, I told my mom or I told, you know, one of my siblings, and then it just opened up this conversation. I didn't know that they were having challenges in certain things. My mother gets involved. We get the rest of our family involved. So it just takes some some sort of bravery and, and really kind of putting your ego aside. At the end of the day, your family. We want to see our family win. We want to see our friends win. Mm -hmm. But it takes somebody to start that difficult conversation. And I've had a lot of difficult conversations with a lot of family and friends. And sometimes it didn't go the way I, I expected. However, at least they know that I love them and I care about them. And that's why I was willing to have that difficult conversation. Beautiful, thank you. Andrew, uh, did you want to to weigh in on that? Oh, it was so well said. So well said, brother. <laughs> I, I definitely appreciate that. I do think we sometimes miss out on those opportunities because we're not prepared for them. Mm. We don't come from a history of being able to have those conversations. I, I do a lot of work with couples and families, and we have these expectations of ourselves and of other people. And what's interesting is, uh, let's say a couple is having a hard time navigating a, an issue. And I ask them the question, um, have you ever seen a couple navigate 
conflict well. And you're like, no, I've never seen it. So how do you expect yourself to do something that you've never seen, you've never witnessed? It's hard because that's not what we've known. That doesn't mean it's not impossible. You can learn those things. You can reach out and educate yourself, inform yourself, connect with people, read, read books. Um, I wrote a book called The Art of a Genuine Apology. Yes, I'm going to plug the book because this emo addressing emotional injury is not something we're used to doing. Most of us come from survival. Let's just say that we, we, we are not living and thriving because we're still working on surviving we don't have a lot of systems in place that have been in place for generations whether it's wealth whether it's education you know we're the first time through first time college first time university first time this so sometimes we have these aspirations which are great but we also have these expectations of ourselves which are not fair so identifying where you want to grow right thinking outside of yourself being response able Right. When we are able to respond, then we can be responsible. Mm -hmm. So if you look mm -hmm. at yourself and say, OK, you know what makes it hard for me to have conversations? Well, I, t I tend to react when this button gets pushed. Well, mm -hmm. what would you want to do instead? Where can you learn that? Right. Don't wait till you're in the middle of a conflict to try to learn how to deal with conflict. You've had enough life experiences for those of who us who are mature to reflect to say, OK, you know, this is where I drop the ball and mm -hmm. I want to be better. So you cannot be a supportive person in someone's life if you got these huge gaps that you're not willing to look at for yourself. However, a lot of us are in survival mode. Um, so be patient, be consistent. You are making progress. Know that. You might not get all the way to your destination, but you're making it better for the next generation. It matters. So it's not one thing. I think it's several things, but being response able is key, looking at where you can grow and trying to fill those gaps. And then like my brothers are saying, ask those questions, get to know people as individuals and see how you can support them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And so well said, and you're right. Healing is a journey. And as you rightfully said that uh, you may not, because we, we're never at a place of complete healing, heal, heal or wholeness, I should say, but we're always on a journey of healing. And as you said, it's, it's making it better for the next generation. So I really, really appreciate that. So there's work that we have to put in. Uh, Samuel Tita, I would like you to weigh in on that question as well, if that's okay. Um. Do you want me to read it again? Yeah, if you could. And certainly. So how can families and friends contribute to creating supportive environment that encourages Black men to prioritize their health? Um, I would say, and I, you know what, I'll, I'll speak off of, this is one instance as an experience. Um, now, it comes, off of, it's, it comes down to conversation, having that uncomfortable conversation. Um, and in order to be progressive, we need to get out of our comfort zone. And I remember, I think I was about 19 years old. And um, I remember my father, he, I can't remember what it was, what the situation was at the time, but he said to, he said to us, he was like, nobody ever asks me if I'm okay. Mm. And I never thought about it because my father has always championed everything. Right. He's always been the leader of the family. So it's never been a case where he comes to us about any situation is we always go to him and he always has the he always he always solves it. It's always solved, you know, um, whichever way it needs to be solved. And he said, you know, nobody ever asks me if I'm OK. And I was just like, what? I couldn't believe it because I thought back. I was like, I don't know if I've ever asked him if he was OK, you know. But I mean, then again, I was also 19 at the time. Um, but I think for the most part, a lot of men are a lot of men, especially a lot of, you know, a lot of black men are never asked if they're OK um, or, you know, what do you need help with or, um, you know, anything along the lines of that. And from there, you know, um, and I'm sure it wasn't comfortable for him to say at the time, but I'm glad he said it to me because after that, I have any any time, you know, any time. 
I, I feel that, you know, uh, a, a brother is, you know, either in distress or seems maybe uncomfortable or even, you know, any man in my family, um, I'll always make sure to ask. I'll always make sure to ask, regardless of what it is, how uncomfortable they might feel. I will make sure that, you know, they're able to open up and say to me because they might not be able to say to anybody else. Right. Um, not everybody is ready to speak to a therapist. Not everybody is ready to open up to somebody outside. But inside, you know, amongst the family, um, we need to make sure that we are asking our loved ones, you know, what's going on? Are you OK? Um, be it man or woman, you know, um, typically women will, you know, um, well, I can't say that. <laughs> I can't speak for every 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 person. Right. Um, but I would say as for men, at least let's make sure that we are checking up on each other. Um, you know, be it your cousin, your uncle, you know, it could be your stubborn grandfather, because I know my grandfather wasn't going to answer anything to anybody. <laughs> but um, but I think that's one thing that we need to make sure we do is just, yeah, just have that uncomfortable conversation until it becomes a comfortable conversation. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Now, I'm going to ask a question that uh, just listening to each of you as a woman right? I'm not, I, I don't believe I represent all women, but um, as a woman, as a sister, as an ally, as a friend, as a future wife, as a mother, my question to you gentlemen is how can we, women, friends, sisters, wives, mothers even, how can we be a support to you? Yeah, I think really acknowledging the greatness that you see within us, right? And sometimes it's it's kind of like you only hear from certain people, whether it's a woman, you know, women in your life, your mother, whoever, when they need you to do something, when you're falling short, when, you know, when, when you're down. And, and sometimes we just need that encouragement to be like, okay, like maybe you're struggling financially, but you, you're you doing well, so amazing with our kids, or maybe you're doing well financially, but there's other areas of your life that maybe need some attention, but acknowledging a man or a boy for what they're doing well and, and leveraging that positivity. And then we can start to have some conversations about like, really, how are you doing now? But when you lead with, I need you to do more of this, you're not doing enough of that, and we get that from society enough as black men. We, we, you know, every time we see ourselves, not every time, but a lot of the times we see ourselves in the media, it's not necessarily in a positive light. So we're getting that all the time. We're getting overlooked in our jobs for promotions. People get promoted over us all the time. So we're getting that. We don't want to come home and get that from our, our women, our mothers, our, our, and, uh, you know, women in our lives. So we need that encouragement. And once we get that encouragement, that will open up other conversations that may need to happen in the real check-in because a man's not going to tell you how he's really feeling when you did when you when you're not in that nurturing space right we're men but we still need to be that nurturing side of a woman right the world is tough it's tough for everybody but i think once we get that that allows us to have those other conversations where you say well how are you really doing and then we can open up from there that's just my opinion and it's a beautiful one. Thank you, Coach Stone. That was amazing. I've I, I've taken notes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think affirmation is is invaluable. One of the things that I also believe is healthy communication is healing communication. So, paying attention to how you speak to someone, right? The tone, and and for this conversation, I'll be very specific about the language. So Coach Stone mentioned, you know, what you need somebody to do. That's what I call negative motivation language. When you tell somebody what they have to do, what they need to do, what they should do, why can't you, all, all this kinds of stuff, your intention is wonderful. And the reason yeah. why I say the intention is wonderful is your assumption is that your man or the man in your life, the man that you're speaking to is capable right? Or you wouldn't ask, you wouldn't have the expectation if you didn't think they were capable. So it's coming from a good place, but the packaging 
is often horrible and it shuts down the conversation. Mm. You don't want to tell a man what he needs to do, what he should do, what he has to do, or the conversation isn't going to get very far. So using positive motivational language, and the, the beauty of this is because women, to be fair, most of you probably say those things to yourself. I need to do this. I have to do this. I should do this, right? It's to emphasize something, but over time that turns into pressure and stress and emphasizes that you don't have control. You don't want to be using that language with yourself because the way that you talk to yourself is often the way you're going to talk to somebody else, right? It's that internal that moves to external. So shifting over to thinking about empowering language. I want to do this. I get to do this. Not I have to do this, but you know what? This is a good opportunity because then it lends to a more healthy conversation when you're talking to a man or a young man to say, you know what? I want this for you. Or this would be really helpful. Are you able to do that? Are you interested in doing that? Is this something that you want to do, right? I would love for the house to smell clean every Friday morning, but the trash is here and I'm not able to take it out. And you agree to help. Would you like to have a clean smelling house? Do you want to keep your word? Is that important to you? Because that's important to me. You're going to create this kind of collaboration because you're harnessing motivation. Quite often people want the same thing, but when you tell them what they need to do, what they have to do, or focus on what they're not doing, it shuts down the conversation and it creates distance. So learning those differences in communication, it will change the culture of your relationship and the culture of your family. And that's what we pass on to the next generation. Right now we're not doing it intentionally. So we're passing on these things that is part of our culture that we're not aware of, but become aware learn how to heal with your words and watch the difference that it makes. Woo! I'm doing a snap nap right good. now. That was I good. Dropped. I like that. <laughs> that was beautiful. And I love how you talked about intention because in my experiences, I've learned because from a cultural standpoint as a Jamaican woman, oftentimes you touched on it as well, Dr. Drew. Uh, oftentimes we, uh, we say certain things and it's not, it's not malicious. It's not meant to harm. It's just culturally, it, we say these things not understanding the impact right. that these things can have on right. an individual. So being mindful of impact versus, versus intention. Exactly. Versus intention. A lot of people are like, but I didn't mean to. I didn't mean right. to. That doesn't really matter. <laughs> that doesn't really. And that speaks to the apology. You don't want to offer an apology and then say, but in the middle of it, mm -hmm. because it cancels out everything that you said in the first place. Own your actions don't excuse based on the intention don't explain the intention just acknowledge you know i see how this impacted you you know i want to do something different next time around you own that own it right and that models for other people to own it too right yeah. dr Jew, you know you're saying some things that are so real right now when you talk about don't excuse it don't divert don't digress own it what I am going to say based on my own unique uh, experiences is we talked about the cultural upbringing. We talked about now with that cultural upbringing, what happens is we are born into families where we think a certain way, we behave a certain way, we act a certain way. Those behaviors and those mindsets are conditioned within us. It takes time. I remember the first time someone pointed out to me that well, what you said was such and such. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't mean to hurt you. That was not what I was intending. It right. took me a very, very long time because subconsciously it's been so embedded in me, right? That this is okay to say, not understanding that impact can be so detrimental, right? Because in my mind, I'm like, I never meant to hurt you. I promise, you know, either it was just a joke or it was just, you know, like careless chatter or whatever the case is. And so with all of that being said, I'm going to just say that for, for, for us who are on the line, you know, sometimes when people are pointing things out to us, don't dismiss it. Like really do the questioning, do the, be willing to do the hard work to, to find out like, where is that all coming from? Because from an unconscious behavioral standpoint, oftentimes it's going to take time for us to really, really, really um, to get it. And what I am going to say to you gentlemen in, with all of that is, Continue to, to make your point. Continue to state it a million times if you have to. 
right? Because again, it's going to take time. It's like repetition works eventually, hopefully, right? So just continue to state your point, continue to allow the women in your lives to understand that, yes, this, I know your intention isn't to harm me, but the impact that it has had, it's, it, it, it hurts, you know? So continue to state that. Don't shut up about it because it helps. <laughs> okay. Samuel, no, so please. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I also think that your actions have to match what you're saying, right? You have to be congruent with what you're saying and doing. Like people can hear what you say and then you go and do something different. You're not, you're not living what you're saying. And so actions can really speak volumes when you're putting in the time and you're trying to, you have the date nights in your relationship and you're making a conscious effort to spend time with your family and be there or commit to your business or whatever your goal is. It's the action, right? Because people will like there's this thing about belief like we think that we're if we just believe in ourselves and we'll we'll get everything we want it's like society just tells you you just got to believe and that's not true that's the biggest lie we've ever been told progress equals belief mm -hmm. so if progress equals belief you just got to get started and as you start to make progress now you believe that it's possible mm -hmm. it is possible to have a loving marriage it is it is possible to have this amazing business it's possible to be a major contributor to my community but it only comes through progress. So you got to get started and you got to be consistent in the way that you show up every day. Sorry, I just wanted to kind of say that because I think that's important as well. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. And for our audience members who are with us today, please feel free to ask questions in the chat or put your virtual hand up. These gentlemen are here to answer your questions. Like we talk so much about men not speaking up. We talk so much about have the lack of events and conversations around black men, their health, their mental well-being. And men are beginning to speak up. Men are beginning to speak up. There are men right now on the platform who are sharing with you what it takes to be a support system. So please, you know, even at the end of this show, please share this with your colleagues, your family, your friends, because this conversation is definitely, definitely important. It's necessary. Uh, so put your questions in the chat. Let's encourage these men to continue to share and to be heard and to create those safe spaces where um, where healing can take place. Right now, Sam, we haven't heard you in a while, so I do want to pose the next question to you, if that's OK. Um, we talk about, um, you know, spouses, friends, sisters and so forth. But what about role models and um, or mentors? What role can mentorship and positive role models play in influencing Black men's health decisions and behaviors? Um, I would say, I mean, role models are, are, are essential to us all, um, especially uh, what we really try to do is um, we try to target the youth. Um, we try to, you know, make sure that they see themselves in us, right? Um, so, I mean, when it comes down to, you know, decision making, um, you know, us sharing personal experiences, things like that, um, <clears throat> it opens up conversation for 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 the next generation. Um, you know, the demolishing, you know, um, unhealthy behaviors. Um, I think one of the things, you know, because I grew up, you know, I grew up in Scarborough, um, Galloway and Kingston. And I think for the difference between me and a lot of other brothers um, that I grew up with <clears throat> was that, you know, I, I had my father in my life and, you know, people can have their father in their lives, but I had an active father in my life who was very, very active. Um, <clears throat> even if he wasn't there, he was always there. Um, so my father being my biggest role model, um, a lot of brothers, you would come around just to see my father in action. So it definitely makes a big difference. A big difference. Very nice. Big up to Mr. Sam Tita. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Andrew, we're just uh we're we're almost there. We have a couple more minutes uh for our final questions. I do want to ask you, Dr. Drew, how can workplaces uh contribute to the well-being of black men considering the potential impact of stressors and environmental factors. I think we've touched on a number of those things today. Getting to know each Black man as an individual is important. It does take time. 
but asking questions because the experiences of one black man are not necessarily the experiences of another. I think it's important to uh, think about the, the, the blessing and benefit of representation. If your organization doesn't seem to have examples for black men to see themselves in different roles, that's gonna have an impact. And even talking about that, acknowledging that is going to be important. Um, I think it's also important, and this may be challenging for, for organizations, but I'll challenge organizations to consider this. When mentoring or coaching, it's important to see the person, not just for an individual, but see them for their true value and their true worth. To invest in that person, not because they're going to help the, co the company, but because they are worth it. See them. If that means, you know what, you're bigger than this company. <laughs> what do you need? Where do you want to go? Do you see that you are this person? Like you can do this. Is this something you ever considered? It may not happen that year. It may not happen in the next five years or the next 10 years. But what you've done is you've planted a seed that that person is not limited to your organization. And I think that's been a missing piece about coaching and mentorship. You cannot coach someone so that they can benefit your business because you're not really caring about the person. Be mm -hmm. aware of that. Someone is going to be loyal to you when you actually see and care about them. So if their time is gonna to come to leave your company, you, you can trust that because you have cared and you've invested your company is going to be blessed. It's going to be benefited. But this person is going to leave and grow and shine. And they're going to remember that. They're going to turn around and be grateful to that company and support that company in other ways, as opposed to just limiting your investment uh, for the sake of the company. So that's that's my that's my challenge. That's beautiful. And I think this um, this actually goes to our final question. This speaks to our final question as well. But feel free if you'd like to add anything else is what, in your opinion, do you do we need more of in terms of support systems? Maybe we'll start off with Sam. What do we need more of? Mm. What do we need more of? Um, we need more consistency. 100 percent. We need more consistency. Um, we need more, I guess we, we definitely need more programs. We definitely need more programs, 100%. Um, and I think there are people around who, you know, are more than capable to champion those programs. Um, I think there's been more than enough people who have tried to have these programs up and running. Um, but I guess the lack of support as well. So more support, 100%. The community knows they need it. We know we need it. Um, the want is there. So we just got to make sure that, you know, it continues to to, to, to follow through. Um, let me think, what else? What else? Um, that's what I could think of at the top of my head right now. Um, if, you know, brothers, if, if, if you can uh, share your, your parts as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think one of the things that is an epidemic in our culture, in our world, even in our organizations, is anxiety. And we don't really understand it, so we don't treat it as such. We don't know how to respond to it. Um, so I think understanding how a negative picture of the future impacts your body, whether you're talking about work, you're talking about family, that will help you to govern yourself in conversations differently with people, will help you to understand people. Because I know that there are these channels for, okay, you can go to get help here. We send our kids to go get help. We send, okay, now you have six sessions of you know EAP counseling. You have this, you have that. But we don't realize that we're contributing to the challenges that people are having in the environment. So they might go there and then come back and then you're just going to keep doing what you're doing, right? So understanding how um, anxiety is playing a role in our lives and how we engage with others and how we can help others 
um, in simple everyday conversations. Like change the environment that you're in by getting a good understanding of something like anxiety. It's woven into our language. It's woven into our interactions. And most people don't know it. So I would definitely say um, pay attention to that. Well said, thank you. And we're going to have you close uh, close off this final question, uh, Coach Stone, if you don't mind. In terms of support systems, what can we do more of? Well, I think both the brothers kind of touched on it, but more of this, like having organizations like the BBPA that have these consistent conversations so that men can come and have these open and honest conversations, right? Like we need more platforms like this, but it's not just about that. Us as individuals, you know, there's a, a philosophy in coaching that says you're naturally curious, creative, resourceful, and whole. Mm. And if you're naturally curious, creative, resourceful, and whole, and you're saying someone should go out and create this platform, somebody should do this, somebody should bring us together, then maybe you're that someone. The same way that all of us, all three of us have created these spaces for, for open dialogue, maybe you're the someone. Maybe you're the solution to your own problem, right? And so I think for some of us, it's like, what's stopping you from having a conversation with you and your friends? What's stopping you from posting something on your social media and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. Any other brothers feeling this way? Well, let's all jump on a call and just let's talk about it. I think sometimes we're always looking to other people to be the solution to your challenge or your problem or your situation. When you have it inside of you, but you have to take the initiative. You have to get uncomfortable. You have to step outside of what you know. You got to stretch yourself. And it's very uncomfortable. I didn't know how to write a book. I wrote two. I didn't know how to start a podcast. I wrote one. I didn't know how to start a, a community. I decided to start one. You just got to get started and you got to work through the fear. You got to do it afraid. And if you know that you're struggling, Reach out to other people and start these conversations and start this dialogue. It doesn't have to be anything formal. You don't have to be have certifications and degrees. Just have a conversation. Mm. Beautifully said. Oh my goodness, my drop. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Coach Stone, Andrew Blackwood, and Samuel Tita. That closes off our conversations of men's health and the role of the support systems. You have been incredible in sharing your insight, your knowledge. Thank you so much for being, once again, the change that you want to see. Thank you on behalf of the BBPA for your time with us today and our audience members and guests. 